I'm just going to ask that we just take a moment. Um, just as Rachel was praying in that last song, there was a phrase from another song that came to mind. It was about breathing in your grace and breathing out your praise. So just perhaps for a moment, I don't know, others might be in the same space or not at all, but I just want to give us a moment to breathe in God's grace and breathe out His praise. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. <coughs> So last Sunday, uh, it was great to have Esther kind of re-inspiring us about vision, and uh, particularly around our vision as, as a church. But today we're going to launch into a new series um, called um, Listen to Jesus. <laughs> and we're going to be looking at the book of Luke, and over the last year we've looked at small chunks of the book of Luke over the last year, and we're going to continue that for a little bit. Um, but I just want to set the scene. So the scene is... The culture that this book was written in is a scene of intense, political, pushing for a revolution, fueled by strict religion, and then there's Jesus. Jesus is walking around in this intense situation and culture around Israel, attracting people to himself because he was totally upside down culture. That's how he did life. Jesus is demonstrating extravagant kindness. He's demonstrating supernatural healing. He's demonstrating breakthroughs in people's individual lives that has a ripple effect in communities. One life is being changed at a time. His, his disciples are following him. They're loving the buds, to be honest. But at the same time, they're crazily in their heads and their hearts, trying to work out what on earth is going on. Work out who is this rabbi that we are following. When he simply said, come, follow me, and they dropped everything, why did they go on that journey? And we're going to jump into um, the book of Luke in Luke 9. Luke has already been gradually revealing who Jesus is. People have a lot of differing views. Jesus asks his closest discipleship disciples in verse 18 of Luke 9, who do the crowds say I am? They reply, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. There's loads of differing views. <clears throat> but then we just go a little bit further. And Peter, one of the disciples, acknowledges that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus warns his disciples and straight away, don't tell anybody. Because the Jews in that culture are expecting a political Messiah. They're expecting the revolution is on the brink. It's going to happen. Things are going to change. The world is going to change. We're going to be top dog. Then immediately, after Peter's confession, Jesus told his disciples about his death and resurrection that was looming. And that rocked them. You can see the emotional, the mental, the kind of physical journey that these disciples, these followers are going on. They're all over the place. <coughs> Yet they understood that Jesus was something different. Jesus, perhaps he was king, but they hadn't understood why he had to die. It was confusing to see that heaven's vision looked like it was breaking into this earth. The culture of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, breaking out into a culture on this earth that sees the goodness and the presence of God come down to reality of life here. Everybody wants that. Yet everybody didn't want the pain and the suffering, the lament, 
arrest me with real life. That was the culture then. I'd suggest we were in the same place now. I'd suggest that we want the presence and the goodness of God to be present in every part of our lives. We're desperate for that. We're pressing into that. But actually, we need to realise that life is real. There is grief. There is lament. There is pain. And we need to understand what is the experiences of the kind of seeing the big mountaintop view with the deep, dark valleys. And recognise that God's presence is in it all. So we're going to look at a familiar passage to some of us. For some of us it might be a new thing. In the Bible it's called the Transfiguration. And we're going to read from verse 28. If you want to follow the Bible, the phone or on the screen. Verse 28. After eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John and James with him. And they went onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of, a, of his face changed. His clothes became bright as a, as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendour, talking to Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfilment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving, Jesus, Pe as the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. That experience would have left a mark on those disciples. That, that would have changed them. It kind of brought their, their past of their Jewish culture come crashing into reality with Jesus, who is divine and human, and present with them right there. And then it pointed towards a glorious future. You see, it was the past, the present, the future, all within a moment. Their eyes were open, their perspective suddenly expanded and changed. And they had to wrestle with what do I do with this? What do we do with this? When Jesus and these three disciples have gone up the mountain in a place of prayer, of communicating <coughs> with the Father God, there was suddenly this encounter moment. Moses, he represented the, the kind of the Jewish law, the, all of kind of the, the Old Testament of the law. Elijah representing the prophets. These were great heroes of the Old Testament. These two guys were these huge heroes of the Jewish faith. They both had rather unusual departures. Moses died on a mountain and God buried him. Elijah was carried to heaven without dying in a chariot of fire. And they both expected to appear at the end of time. So maybe those disciples were thinking, is this it? Is this the moment coming now? They both appear and Jesus is suddenly transformed, transfigured, becoming radiant. It's at the point where humanity meets God. The conversation is about Jesus' departure. And then you get Peter. Practical Peter. Let's get some tents up. Yay. Perhaps we don't want this moment to end. Ever been there? In that moment of encounter with Jesus, you don't want the moment to end. You want to put your tent up. Stay there. Or perhaps not a tent. <laughs> nice, comfortable hotel room would be nice. <laughs> but this is not God's plan. In fact, the trial was just around the corner. Peter, James and John would find themselves very soon in a different place that wasn't as glorious. They would find themselves in a place called Gethsemane. In a place where there wasn't glory, it was filled with sorrow. And as I've dwelled on this this week, and 
I would remind you that we all need to find places of encounter where our vision of Jesus changes. The place of encounter here seems to be a place of hanging out with Jesus. Jesus hanging out with his Father, dramatic stuff happens. God chooses to reveal Jesus even more to those disciples. So I'm translating that to what does that look like to me in 2020? What's my mountain place? What's my hidden place? Where's the time, where's the place that I find that my perspective and my vision of Jesus and of God's changes? People often say to us, why, as Esther mentioned, in a notice area about our 24-7 prayer weeks, why have we done those for over 10 years? Because we believe as a church, the place of prayer, the place of worship, is a place where our perspective changes. And that's great that we do it together, but it's even, even better when we find those places ourselves, individually. Prayer changes us, it changes the world. Jesus himself says later on in Luke, he encouraged us to, to cry out day and night, to cry out day and night, to persist in prayer. And there's evidence right throughout church history that this is where stuff changes. Here's a few examples I found on the, on the 24-7 prayer website. Pentecost. The day when the church was born, the Holy Spirit came upon this bunch of Christians, came to a prayer room. Paul urged the Thessalonians later in the New Testament to pray and continue constantly. The early church joined together constantly praying, says in Acts 1. Celtic monks in Bangor Abbey in Ireland prayed continually for 200 years. In a place near Dublin, I can't even say the name, God led a young guy by the name of Kieran to start a monastery that prayed for the best part of a thousand years. And it sent missionaries all over the globe. <coughs> and finally, in the 18th century, a small group of Moravians, this is a great story if you want to read the first <coughs> A, f a small group of Moravians began a 24-7 prayer meeting that lasted over 100 years. It mobilised 3,000 missionaries and converted a man called John Wesley. John Wesley and his brother Charles Wesley were involved in the revival that happened here in the UK and across the globe. <coughs> it started in a place of encounter, a place of prayer and worship, of saying, God, we need to see more of you. Can't just go through the nations. We have a 24 7 prayer week coming up soon. It's time to, to pray to our vision as church. But it's a time, a space away from the noise, away from phones, away from um, family, job, all the kind of stuff that gets in our head, swirls around and around and around, <coughs> stops us into a place. It's about being creative, maybe even fasting. In 1 Corinthians it says this, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. In this post-resurrection, post-Pentecost, post-Jesus walking on this planet Earth, the Holy Spirit has come on all people that we can also pursue to be transformed, transfigured, radiant by Jesus. But we need to be intentional about that. It's not just a maybe or something happen. It's an intentionality. In the middle of Peter's communication, in this passage, he's wanting to extend that moment. He's 
wanting it to be a longer moment than he can to man. And gets all practical. He's probably half, half asleep when he's doing that. But then suddenly this other thing happens. A cloud appears. That cloud is a throwback situation. It's a real present situation there, but it's a throwback to the, the, the people of Israel. They walk through the wilderness with Moses, who also appears for 40 years, with a cloud over a tabernacle box during the daytime and a pillar of fire by night. I'm not going to go into all the, it's really complicated, <laughs> into all the kind of theological, historical relevance to the cloud, because if I'm honest, I don't know every bit well enough to be able to communicate it in a way that you might even understand. But I do know that box, that tabernacle box, represented the presence of God. And the cloud was there as the presence of God. The Jewish people, they knew something, that there was a, a history, a destiny that was centered around the presence of God. 24-7. 24-7, the presence of God was right with them. The, one of the dictionaries, Bible dictionaries called the Expository Bible Dictionary says this, the tabernacle pointed to the chief end of man, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Above every other consideration was the fact that the omnipotent, there's another word I've got to say, unchanging and transcendent God of all the universe had means of the tabernacle graciously come to dwell or tabernacle with his people. Above this tabernacle was where the pillars of cloud were. This cloud appeared here in this situation. The presence of God and Lot's vision and a way forward. The presence of God and Lot's vision for us individually and a way forward. Because we're about walking with him. Jesus is a relational, it's not a religion. And he wants to communicate that same stuff to us. Bono. Bono, the lead singer of Beauty. I said that's my case, they went to. I would argue he's a cultural prophet of probably a generation. I'd also argue that Stormzy is probably a cultural prophet of this generation. And Bonham once said this, I wonder, I often wonder, if religion is the enemy of God, it's almost my religion is what happens when the spirit has left the building. We need the presence of God in every single part of our lives. We need to see that unlock as we listen to him. Above all the noise of our lives, we need to hear him speak, to hear what Jesus is saying, because his presence is with us and in us. When the cloud came, the disciples were afraid. There's loads of stuff around that. Don't deny that the presence of God is not a holy presence. It is a holy presence. But Paul writes, as we read, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. He wants us to enjoy being in his presence. In verse 35, he says, a voice came from the cloud, saying, this is my son, whom I have chosen. To listen to him. Again, it's a throwback moment. Jesus at his baptism in Luke 3 says, it says this, when all the people have been baptised, Jesus was baptised. And as he was praying, heaven was opened. <coughs> A vision of heaven suddenly breaking out into earth. And the Holy Spirit descended on him and bodily formed like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. The difference between those situations is God is speaking to the disciples this time. He's speaking from just saying, this is Jesus, this is my son, I'm well pleased. To this is my son, I listen to him. I'm well pleased with him. 
with all our different ways of connecting, of listening, of relating, understanding. There is no one way to hear how Jesus speaks to us. I'm not going to go, you need to do it like this because we'll all feel guilty. You need to find your ways that, in, as you're walking in the presence of God, in doing whole of life, hearing him speak. What does that look like for you? The whispers every day. I saw this recently on, um, on social media. And it was how one person responded to Jesus. And it says this, This year I want to be more like Jesus. I want to hang out with those that no one else wants to hang out with. I want to upset religious people. I want to tell stories that make people think. I want to choose unpopular friends. I want to be kind, loving and merciful. And I want to take naps on boats. <laughs> That's that one person's hearing, seeing what Jesus is speaking to them. But I'll be honest, there are, I'm aware now uh, that I've failed in this. I'm aware that maybe I put too much on a moment of encounter without realising that Jesus changes our perspective and our vision, sometimes in a moment, but sometimes in a process. <coughs> there is obedience when our eyes are open to a bigger vision of God. And he opens up more about who he is and what he's speaking to us. The key is about intentionally walking with Jesus. And that's every season. From the mountain pop top to the deepest valley. In the discouragement, in the, the high moments, in the disappointments, in the grief, in the hurt, in the dullness of life. Jesus is present in every single one of those. Pete Gregg once said, God is sometimes silent, but never absent. He has promised to be present even in the pain. And quoting from Scripture, nothing can ever separate us from his love. Here's two moments that I don't think I've shared them with you. I've encountered for me in the last six months. Once I was going for a walk on Stoke Park. I've only discovered it in the last year, it's nice. I was listening to some worship music and feeling quite weighed down, carrying way too much. And God broke in and reminded me he was here. His yoke is easy, his burden is like he is here. It didn't remove all the weights. I didn't feel like, but I was feeling with God broken and emotionally I was all over the shop. Another one was on a prayer walk. It started off a bit disappointing because I was the only one there. <laughs> it was an early prayer walk. And then Rose came along. And we walked around Upper Hallfield. It was pitch black. <laughs> we walked around Upper Hallfield. And I had an encounter moment there that was just a few words of encouragement and realisation that God was going to do something in every church and in our local community. It's a process, this one, because I'm still trying to work out what those exact words mean, which is why I'm saying anything. Because I'm trying to work out God, what you're saying. Both of those were encounter moments in very different ways. Some of you will say, actually, I have it in a, a setting where there's lots of people, where there's worship. Or where I'm hearing a talk that somebody's just on. That's the encounter moment. God opened up something in my life. Am I sorted now? No. Do I forget that God wants to break in and show me his glory? Yes. But the transfiguration encouraged those disciples by showing them that they were rabbi that they were following and slowly discovering. Who he was was more than a rabbi. And that he was going to suffer and die soon. And for me, I'm slowly discovering a little bit more. Some encounter moments like that that I want to press into are actually open up another layer of me. 
The response to listening to Jesus is obedience. That's where the rubber hits the road. Walking with Jesus is not neat and tidy. If you don't know Jesus here this morning, I'm not going to gloss it over and say it's a nice easy road. It's an amazing journey. He will be right with you. He will protect you. He will stand with you when everyone else runs away. But it isn't nice, neat, and tidy. Walking with Jesus is responding to that initial call, come, follow me. Martin Smith writes a load of songs we sing here. He wrote these songs and these words in a song recently. Everybody is broken. Everybody is broken and everybody breaks. But the bones will walk again. God the Master told the bones, watch this, I'm bringing the breath of life to you and you will come to life as I prophesy. There was a sound and oh, a rustling. That's Ezekiel. Read that in the message version. It will blow your mind. Everybody is broken and everybody breaks. Obedience is both individual and together. We need to do this together because this is our family. But we also need to find those places individually. Maybe as we share communion, God just wants to speak to you individually. So let's just take a moment. Come Holy Spirit, will you and the German words. Yeah, yeah, yeah.